Welcome to On Your Own Terms. I'm Patty Talbot, and this is the place where we learn together what it takes to change the world on our own terms and in our own special way. Today, I have the distinct privilege of having with me Dana Mortensen. Dana is the founder of World Savvy, an organization that's had a profound effect and impact on my own life as a hopeful change maker. I sought out World Savvy back around 2012, 2013, when I was taking groups of students to Malawi in Africa and discovering that I had a lot to learn about how to interact cross-culturally in an environment so very different from my own. I was charged with developing global competencies in my students, but I realized I had a lot of work to do on my own cultural and global competencies. And that's when I found the GCC, the Global Competence Certificate Program offered through World Savvy. From the very beginning, I was inspired and moved by Dana Mortensen's work, as I know you will be today. And today, Dana is with us to tell us her own story using the Blue Roads Changemaker Framework, Homegrown Solutions for a Patchwork World. Welcome, Dana. Thank you for being with us. So I'm Dana Mortensen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of World Savvy, which is a national education nonprofit that's been focused on building inclusive, adaptive, and future-ready education systems for about 18 years, but really focused on integrating cultural and global competence into the ethos and the foundations of how we define quality education. To think about sort of the origins of my journey as a change maker and just how my growing up experience really impacted this is I was born in New Jersey and my my dad is a teacher. Was He was then a sociology professor, but then he migrated into the K-12 space by the time I got to college. And really early on, the environment that they created in our house was one of curiosity, a lot of discussion, a lot of just kind of inquiry-based approach to the world. I, I don't remember a morning that I'd come down into the kitchen when I didn't hear the all things considered kind of theme music going in the background and national public radio. And and so my parents were just very active. They, they talked a lot about politics. They talked a lot about um, civic issues. And so that was in the air that I was breathing from the time I was small. And I grew up in a typical suburb uh, in New Jersey of Manhattan. So I'm the youngest of three children, two older brothers. And I started playing basketball when I was five years old, when I was really little. My dad is a basketball fanatic. He's five foot seven and blind in one eye. And so his own basketball career, he likes to say, was thwarted by those issues. But he was, you know, a super fan and he was a, an early coach for me. And basketball was really foundational for a couple of reasons, because it's obviously such a team-based sport. And I started so young that m my conception of engagement and getting things done was completely collaborative. It was always, it was sort of embedded in a team mentality from a young age. And the other was that basketball drew a very diverse group of folks socioeconomically. You didn't need a ton of money to play basketball. It started when I was five and there were very few girls basketball camps. So I used to go to camps where I was the only girl at an all boys camp because my dad sort of lobbied to let me come in on the coattails of my brothers. And it also was a lens on equity and justice and, and gender equality because at those times, being a young girl playing basketball, this was pre WNBA and, and everything else. And so just exposing me to lots of diversity of experience in terms of the people that I played the game with. And so this team and collaborative mentality and also this lens on gender equality and justice was an early seed that was planted for me. Education was sort of the bedrock and the foundation. of. And my dad was on the school board for the K-8 district that I went to. And so this was very much in conversation about how important and critical that was. The other piece of it, it was my dad really was kind of an internationalist. He had lived and worked in Africa. And so our living room was filled with African art and artifacts that he had brought back in his journeys and books and music. And so that was the other aspect of even though I was growing up in a suburban town that, you know, at the time, very different now, was not incredibly diverse from kind of a global perspective, nor was the school that I attended. My growing up experience had a lot of that exposure. And so those were all really early influences for me in terms of how I saw the world and how I learned to move through it. I went to a school that I would say now in my capacity as world savvy, trying to think about how to change the K-12 education system. 
it is a reaction to a lot of the experiences I had. Not that I didn't have wonderful teachers or that I didn't have good experiences in my K-12. I certainly did. Um, I had great memories from it. But it really was a byproduct of sort of a, a lot of the systems that are more rote memorization and kind of an industrial schooling model. And so I was in high school during Desert Storm, and I remember that just sort of rolling in the TVs to look at the battles. But there was no discussion of root cause of conflict or any of the, the more sort of complex elements of what it means to be at war or why we got there in the first place or who and how we were involved as an actor on the global stage. And so that whole K-12 trajectory was, for me, being immersed in a lot of discussion and learning about the world, not in the classroom, and then coming to see it, what I would now call a more food flag festival sort of look at the world and about difference that served to sort of exoticize our understanding rather than create resonance, you know, more dissonance than resonance. It was famine in Africa. It was probably the only sort of straight line into your living room and into your school and the era of We Are the World and commercials and depicted black babies with flies on their head. And that's sort of what this depiction of the dark continent was kind of streaming into our living room while I was living and being raised by a man who had, you know, much different experiences. And so I think the juxtaposition of that also sort of got me really curious and thinking at a pretty young age around what we know and the, the stories that we tell ourselves and how limited they are by the experiences and the boundaries right around us. And so I think naturally during that time, if we think about kind of origin as a change maker, there was something developing in me that was curious and inquisitive about that system and also critical of it. I, I was lucky enough to grow up in a house where that approach to sort of critical thinking was really encouraged. The issues that were most important to me, on the one hand, it was this idea of you know, global issues generally and international issues and understanding the world, which had been a thread throughout. I knew when I got to college that I wanted to study international relations, I didn't have any idea what I would do with it necessarily, but I had always craved understanding about the larger world and how I individually and our country and the place that I was from and my community connected to it. And so I did know that. And on the other hand, education was this other parallel interest and deep passion. I had had this experience of this kind of industrial K-12 model that, yeah, produced graduates that got into school and, and did well, but also had this glimpse of what wasn't there and what I, I didn't know or understand. Japanese internment wasn't even in the curriculum. I remember I remember when I learned that Japanese internment happened and I it wasn't until it wasn't from a course in school. There were moments like that in my K-12 experience that were so alarming about what gets left out depending on who's telling the story and whose truth is, is taking center stage. And so the interest in international affairs and global studies intersected with education in that way. That's like, I'm so interested in the world, but I'm also aware of being educated in a system that's made some particular choices about how we've come to understand the world. And that is not truth in and of itself, incontrovertible truth. And so what do I make of that? When I left college, I had, I had studied international affairs and I had minored in education and actually ended up kind of interning in a magnet school in New London. I went to Connecticut College for a couple of years. And that was another eye-opening look into sort of one of the other pieces about education was this idea of equitable access to quality education. And for me, quality education had to have this kind of expansive view and had to center students in the process. Who they are and what they knew and what their identity is, is central to how they learn about everything around them. And I saw that in action as I was working in schools and, and just became very passionate about that. Over time, as schools and schools have become much more segregated and we have these enormous gaps, achievement gaps, or I would say opportunity gaps, in systems. At the time I became interested in this, I also started to hone in on and realize that there was this persistent low expectation threshold for young people of what they're capable of and what they could know. And that we had sort of developed around the time I was leaving college, this is in the 90s, the sort of, well, there's the experts and there's the policy wonks. And then this was the Whitney Houston song, like children are the future, as opposed to they have agency and potential as change makers right now. People's contributions were sort of siloed and boxed up and limited back then in a way that I think has changed completely now, right? You look at Greta Thunberg, you look at a million activists across the globe who are not confined by how old they are. And I think that pendulum is beginning to swing and shift. This idea that those kids, quote unquote, weren't ready to learn about global things because you just have to master reading and writing. And 
I always found that to be challenging when I confronted it in my work. Achievement gaps were being what they were as I was coming out of college, I would hear this refrain, yeah, these wow. kids aren't ready. And the reality is young people who have grown up in close proximity to poverty or environmental justice issues or human rights and gender equity issues or racial equity, not only do they have proximity and experience to know and appreciate what the impact of these issues have on people's lives, but that's what they experience and know and feel passionate about changing. And so if you want to make learning relevant, then meeting young people where they are about things they care about seems so logical to me to do that rather than reserving it for a time when you had gotten through the basics, so to speak. And I also just sort of questioned what the basics were as I was beginning to step out into my next step beyond school and thinking about how it was I wanted to make an impact in the world. This is the era of No Child Left Behind. And it definitely felt like I have young kids now, the equivalent of if you have a child that doesn't want to eat broccoli, and in order to make them like broccoli, you just feed them nine servings of broccoli and nothing else, as opposed to baking it in a casserole and covering it in cheese and figuring out creative ways to integrate it. And I think the broccoli in this instance was like the basics reading and writing and everything else got cut out. And at the end of the day, I was watching that happen alongside my own professional interests evolving and thinking disengaged learners aren't successful learners. If you don't care about what you're learning, if you can't see yourself in it, if you don't feel connected to it, you might be able to get through the material and pass a test potentially, but you won't retain it and you won't activate it in a way that's meaningful. And so by the end of my academic experience, at least through college, those things were starting to intertwine in a really important way for me. And worked at a law firm in New York City for a few years and then was accepted to Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs. And I, I went there to get a degree in international economic and political development. It's an international affairs master's degree. First day I met a friend. And so the story of World Savvy and the origins of sort of the vehicle for change making for me the past couple of decades, it was really born of something intensely personal and hyper local and hyper homegrown, you know, to use your framing, which was really just a friendship and love and learning about someone else's story and seeing the world as it was changing in the United States through their eyes and their experience. My friend Madiha, brilliant, brilliant woman who had grown up throughout the Mideast and from Bangladesh, went to high school in Singapore and came to the US to attend college. We ended up sort of in every class together, super close. She had this really effortlessly global worldview. She's one of those people that you meet who can move through kind of groups of people and conversations about any number of issues, who's so incredibly comfortable with complexity and who has a capacity to sort of move through, exist and contribute to really diverse environments of thinking and, and doing and being. And, and that's also a product of her growing up, right? She was very immersed in learning environments that were that way and in, in a lot of other environments that offered that to her, but just also She's just a, a really incredible person, and I, I really admired that about her. And summer between the two years of graduate school, she went back to Bangladesh, and I interned for the UN. And then we came back, and a week into our second year, 9-11 happened. And I lost a friend on the first plane that hit the tower, and there was almost no degree of separation, right? If you were I'm from New Jersey, I was working in New York, colleagues, coworkers, friends that I grew up with, friends of friends. My apartment was a block from the armory where they listed missing missing and deceased. There would just be throngs gathered there for weeks and, you know, saw the second plane hit the tower and all kinds of things that were just that time was obviously incredibly tragic. And there were some ways in which community was bonding together, but there was also a really severe xenophobic backlash. And so such a conflicting time to be an American in the sense that obviously love the country I live in and was born in and I'm a citizen of, but feeling really ashamed of, given our own origins, how that xenophobic backlash really came out. And to me, and so Madiha, who was physically and verbally assaulted at that time, all of the work we were doing, we we're doing a thesis on microfinance kind of shifted. And we looked just sort of in the place and space we were and said, where are we headed as a world? And how has this country set ourselves up to be living an inclusive, engaged, prosperous, and safe community that exists in this, this future-facing reality, which was, we knew would be, much more diverse in communities everywhere, rural or otherwise, much more interconnected with the globe. I mean, we're talking during a global pandemic. If there isn't a better example of how, how interdependent and interconnected we are, I, I, can't, you know, I don't know that I can find one right now. And Medea's mother 
who was the founder of the first school in Bangladesh post-independence. And so her worldview similarly was very fixated on, yes, we have these interests in international development, but really education is the bedrock. And at the time, what we were doing felt like a Band-Aid. I mean, it really did. To be working in international development felt like we were doing something kind of at this point in a continuum when if the general population and citizenry didn't know about, care about, and feel deeply engaged with these issues and understand how they were incredibly relevant to their own lives, whether they never left their neighborhood or not, then it wouldn't matter what policy did. And so we really shifted and said, we're going to spend you know, the entirety of our second year and kind of on a parallel thesis about a landscape analysis of K-12 education and how did it really meaningfully prepare young people for this world that's more diverse, interconnected, undeniably global. However you feel about that word, right? Substitute whatever constitutes connected and interdependent. So that process was born out of this friendship and this love where I felt such shame almost and embarrassment. And my mom was born in the Bronx, you know, to wander around a city that could treat its own residents the way that I saw and experienced. It sat heavy with me. And so Anybody that's tried to have an argument about immigration or something else on Facebook with a bunch of 40 and 50 and 60 year olds knows that to a certain degree, the deal is sealed. And so if you want to cultivate mindsets that allow for empathy and open thinking, you certainly can start that later in life, but it works a whole lot better to inform how we engage as citizens as adults if we're, if this is something that's just a, a piece of what education looks like. Maria and I spent that whole year without knowing where it would lead. As a change maker, I had no real interest in the nonprofit sector per se. I wanted to solve a problem. That was really the motivation. And the problem that we saw was that the way global education was tackled was siloed. It was, it showed up in well-resourced environments and independent schools. It was fragmented and food flag festival. It was surface level. It wasn't based on competency development. It was based on contents and facts only. And the prevalence of things like travel programs, which I think are amazing. You know, we all know people who are well-traveled who still manage to be xenophobic, right? So that we wanted to look at the K-12 experience as what are those deeper competencies that both for teachers and students really need to be baked into what teaching, learning, and school climate and culture look like. And so World Tavi was born from that experience. At the end of, of grad school, when we moved to the Bay Area to get things up and running, mainly because New York's one of the largest districts in the country. It's sort of like its, its own anomaly in many ways. And we wanted a, a district that was more manageably sized, a friendly environment for nonprofits, but one that also struggled with a lot of the same issues urban public school districts were struggling with, which is declining enrollment, achievement gaps, funding challenges. So that was why we went there. And I think those early years in San Francisco and Oakland were so critical because going back to that issue of equity and equitable access, we were teaching in charter schools. It was during the small schools movement. They were breaking apart large comprehensive schools that had really high truancy rates and not great test scores and kind of from an achievement standpoint. And we were working directly with young people in these classes to learn about the world, and many of whom didn't know the capital of California through no fault of their own. They had never had a geography class. They certainly hadn't had sort of any exposure to world issues integrated in. And and so that was some of the hardest work that we've done, but also some of the most mind opening. I still remember one of the students that was in this class. It was like the early um, development of what became World Savvy's Knowledge to Action model that for young people, particularly who are growing up in circumstances where they may feel limited by their socioeconomic status or not having access to a lot of resources and feeling that their influence is limited as a result, to have an opportunity to look at issues around them in their community through a solutions-oriented lens and start to build plans for how they might take action, whether that was a big A or little A, right? Just how to start to engage differently with the world around them. And I think that the global aspect in those instances, to a large degree, provide hope. You see that, oh, wow, this is an issue that happens across the globe. People look at this in different ways. They deal with things in different ways. I'm not the only person in a community here in the Bay Area that struggles with this issue. And, you know, some really just amazing things came out. We kind of, that was our first experiment with saying, let's just put this learning in the hands of students and see what they develop. So there's one, one student I, I still remember that, you know, never really was active in discussion during class that much, but towards the end had worked on this, essentially what became a knowledge to action cycle for us. And 
anyone who's studied poverty or looks at that issue holistically knows that it's so much about choice, right? It's, it's less about money and more about choices, a, a dearth of choices and the opportunity to have more choices and, and dignity. And so this young man said, you know, one of the things that I think we really should have is my family has never been to a restaurant where you make reservations and couldn't see like sort of a, the trajectory of when that might happen and, and sort of looked at that as kind of a, a mark of something dignified an experience that was really deeply meaningful to him. And it was an eye opener, well, it should be for anybody that, that, that took that for granted, right? That this is something that you do often. And so he developed, you know, his knowledge to action project was developing a model for a restaurant where you could make reservations and that there was a rotating way of essentially funding families that might be on public assistance, but that that wasn't sort of the forward facing discourse. You'd, you'd get a certain number of spots for a reservation for families on public assistance, and then you'd call to these restaurants that a lot these tables um, where things could be heavily discounted to be able to enjoy the same experience. And this was like 18 years ago. So it was a more well thought out plan than what I just described, but the, the general gist of it was simple and amazing genius to come from someone who's experience is is basically underscoring that, you know, if you want to affect outcomes and create hope in the communities where I'm from, then create opportunities for for people to feel the sense of dignity and respect. And that was the sort of leapfrogging from, I guess, the foundations of thinking about the issues that I was passionate about to really just striking out on our own, or, you know, we at the time like to say kind of jumping off the cliff without, you know, not knowing if the chute would open fully, the parachute would open, but but being about 90% sure. And and I think as a founder, Medea and I used to talk a lot about all the things we didn't know before we took the leap and that that's probably a good thing, just about trying to get a movement off the ground. Navigating across difference for me, and I would say that in recent years, especially as World Savvy has grown across the country and now do a lot of work in rural communities, I am and we are an outsider in a lot of the places that we partner with. And I think, and even, you know, in the work that we've done around the globe, we've worked in more than 19 countries through the GCC and through these other partnerships, these programs that either bring teachers abroad or bring students here or students abroad. And I think how I've learned to interact with people that are different from myself is just entering into those in relationships and those experiences with a whole lot of humility and curiosity and a, and a default setting that those individuals know and understand the most about their own circumstances, that nothing that I could learn in a book or read in an article or interpret from my own is going to replace that and that it has deep meaning and value. Even if I don't agree with what I'm hearing, it doesn't, you can't disagree with an experience. I think that's been central to me, especially in these years as World Savvy looks to sort of think about what is inclusive growth across 50 very diverse states and very diverse regions where education looks different in a lot of places. That's really been at the forefront is kind of honoring the fact that what you know where you are is expertise, your experience that's a given. And then the other thing that stays with me when I think about um, navigating across difference is really trying to understand the limitations of knowledge. There's this story in, I don't know if you've read Trevor Noah's autobiography. I'd really recommend it to any listeners. It's pretty fantastic. And there's this one, without kind of spending too much time on it, there's this one passage that Trevor describes growing up in you know Soweto and the slums of Soweto. And he has a friend named Hitler. And at the time, you know, they didn't think much of it. I mean, they knew who Hitler was, but it, there, if you were in apartheid South Africa, there were, you know, naming your children after famous white people was a thing that was done. I mean, he explains it as like, yeah, there were lots of, but he also, the, he has the realization about Hitler's name when they go, they were DJs. They went to a Jewish school to actually DJ at the school and they introduced themselves and he introduced himself as Hitler. And of course they get kicked out of this Jewish school. And his reflection on this was Hitler, obviously a terrible figure in history. But, you know, if you're in Africa, King Leopold, or there's some, you know, he, I mean, there's, there's some folks that might be, who, for whom might be the bigger devil in the, in the equation, right? That Westerners and, and white people generally have really well-documented histories of, of the atrocities that were committed against. And, and so because it's known and understood in the vernacular as something so terrible, it, it, um, and it is. But it doesn't mean that truth and perspective from, you know, he really, it was a moment where I was like, that's the way that I would 
sum up and describe how I think about how we select knowledge and what we prioritize and how we we present that. We make so many choices, right? That's something that I try and keep with me that I'm a believer that you have to have good, you have to have knowledge and seek knowledge to have an understanding about complex issues, but that there will always necessarily be limitations on that. You are, you will constantly be um, making decisions and navigating situations without full knowledge and understanding. And what does it look like to do that to the best of your ability? So I think that's helped when I've been in environments where, you know, I'm navigating a lot of difference, whether that's in the issue itself, the culture, people. And then I also, I like to remember that I don't think any one person or individual can represent the experience of an entire group. And I try very hard not to think about any individual as sort of representing in a monolithic sense, the experience of a culture, or I could no more represent what white girls from New Jersey think about everything than, than, than anyone else could about, uh, about their, their own experience. So I think it's kind of that balance about like honoring that each person's individual experience in, is, is in and of itself worth giving deference to, but also, you know, being careful not to extrapolate and generalize from that. So those have been really important things in navigating difference and also just a huge amount of self-deprecation. My sense of humor naturally is inclined towards that. And so it's really come in handy because I find so much fault in the way that I navigate the world. I really have um, challenges with kind of expert label or expertise label when, especially when it comes to a field like global competence, because by its very definition, you, you're never there, right? You're always seeking and I will stumble if I'm kind of doing it right. I will stumble and find myself confronted with new situations that I don't always navigate expertly, but that I'm trying to and that I learn from and I apply it. I have a, a huge, huge willingness to be vulnerable with people that I need about those failings because I think we all have them and I think we all live with bias and I think we all live with all kinds of things that taint our worldview. And the only thing we can do is show up ready to interrogate that for ourselves in a way that's very honest and very authentic and hopefully if we're brave enough uh, open with others so world tabby's journey you know starting back in 2002 we spent the first five years going deep and saying working with students working with teachers and trying to understand what did they need how could this approach to teaching and learning work inside a school with all of its complexities and all the challenges that teachers face and then just doing a lot of listening just talking to anyone that would listen and so i think in the early days of world savvy expanding influence was a spent a disproportionate amount of time doing what i would say is generating demand talking about listen the world is changing the way that we're teaching young people isn't preparing them for the for one job a 40 year career at a at an automobile plant anymore like we're preparing them for a new reality in the workforce. We're preparing them for a new reality in our communities where I'm as likely to have a Somali and a Hmong neighbor as I am a white neighbor, where cultures and languages and every kind of diversity is, we're much more proximate to it wherever we're living and that that's, it's just going to change how we have to think about it. Never mind the fact that classrooms are now um, population under 18 is a collective majority. And so if you're teaching in a classroom, you are much, much more likely to have this rich and wonderful expanse of diversity in terms of linguistic and cultural and ethnic diversity. And I think trying for teachers to dislodge this notion that they had to be an expert. I have a degree in international affairs. I think that's like, as you know, as useless as the monopoly money I played with my girls in yesterday to a degree, other than that it taught me to think in a certain way. But you, you could read enough this week to be more up to speed on a lot of the issues that I studied now 20 years ago. And so it's not to say I don't value that that degree is there, but it's to say that I don't think any of us with a world that's changing this rapidly and and also is this complex and interdependent can have can be expected to have subject matter expertise across every arena and so the job of an educator becomes well how do you then facilitate learning in this changing world in this complex space where there's oh my god there's so much to know right the half life of knowledge is like shrinking every second and now kids can get more knowledge on the internet and how can i possibly be expected to know and the answer is you can't which is back to my sort of notions around knowledge. So those early expanding sp spheres of influence have been related to, I think about it in terms of expanding spheres of learning. I think as a change maker, you generate influence when you continue to keep yourself open to learning, not only more about what you're already doing, but how about how other people are contributing to that tapestry of innovation and how their thinking can influence and change what you're doing.
They're definitely Thank you so much, Dana. Again, I learn from you every time I hear you speak. I know our audience has as well. You can get involved with the work at World Savvy by looking them up and following Dana Mortensen and following World Savvy at worldsavvy.org, wherever you're doing social media. You can support the work. I know they're always looking for contributions and they're always looking for advocates to help promote their message. At Blue Roads Education, we're particularly interested and committed to developing global competencies in rural communities. So I challenge you, as I challenge myself every day, to think globally and to interact as much as I can with other humans with an open heart and an open mind and the curiosity that Dana prescribes for us today. I wish you well in your own changemaker journey that includes, of course, a global mindset and development of global competencies. I look forward to seeing you next week on your own terms. In the meantime, may you be grounded in your beingness, guided in your doingness, generous in your connectedness, and inspired in your reflectiveness so you can change the world on your own terms. I'm Patty Talbot. I'm always learning, and I know you are too.